We took over the city, leaving all of our allies behind to potentially drown in the river. <laughs> but now we're le- going to what I'm going to call the conclusion of this campaign's first act, which is taking over the city's naval port. A very, a very strate- uh, strategic spot in this in this battle. Because I know, yeah. I know it's not strictly a uh, front mission style game, but it is kind of reminding me of some of the mission chains in one and three. Kind of does, yeah. I, I played some of front mission one, so I know what you're talking about. But yeah, mm. we got to take over this uh, over this port, and the way to do it is to take out our primary target, a battleship. If you can get rid of that, like, this place is toast and the rest of the Pacific Rim forces can, like, set up shop here and, like, provide more forces to take over the rest of the island. This is going to be difficult. We've both got about the same turning circle. (laughs) Yeah. It's telling us about, like, some wire nettings that we can technically walk across to avoid going into the water, but they are super flimsy and really only useful if you're going in with a light VT. Like, even medium uh, weight class is way too risky. And because the because the unit we're going with for this one is also a, is also a medium weight, I am not going to do anything that isn't just sticking to the already predefined bridges. So we're going with the Scareface. I'm pretty that sure is the most intimidating name I've ever heard. I also think it was probably meant to be Scarface, but it's just like some uh, some typo or mispronunciation on the Japanese part that they just did not really bother fixing <laughs> just picturing someone going up and like you know how they used to draw um pinup girls on uh b-52 bombers and the like oh. back in the second world war oh hell yeah just someone doing that but it's like a an angry emoji going <laughs> okay so yeah this um this mission is a bit longer than the ones we've dealt with up to this point and it's because of that, uh, that after delaying it from the last video, you'll get to see what uh, supply runs look like. But also you get to see, uh, as far as first generation VTs go, the Scareface I feel is like a good follow up to the, uh, to the Decider. Like if you for some reason don't want to stick to like, I guess like the primary intended uh, first gen VT, this is a very good alternative. Oh, you also get to see what happens when you don't hit start at the right time when, like, all five bars are not above the certain threshold. You kind of have to, like, redo that again. Just hear the clutch going... (coughs) Yeah. So, one thing that I guess you could say that the Scareface is specialized in is that... uh, it's a long range of VT, like one of its main weapons it, it gets is the 320 SR. The SR standing for sniper rifle. So it's it has the benefit of firing 320 millimeter shells at way longer ranges than even like comparable rifles that other VTs use. Yeah, on a on that kind of scale, it'd be more like a recoilless rifle. Yeah. Or you know, artillery. Mm-hmm. I mean, we still have that. We, we brought the 77 recoilless uh, rocket launcher back with us, hopefully to do better with it. Yeah. Demonstrating that the that you can change like the the line color on your HUD, which can be nice depending on like the environment you're in and like kind of like the color. So we're fighting against other scare faces as we're approaching. These ones are definitely a step up. Uh, compared to uh, uh, to the other VTs we faced, on the fact that they're a lot more dodge happy. It's also kind of a disappointment that the draw distance in the game is so bad because you're you're able to target them before they actually appear on screen. Yeah, it's it's definitely like the biggest technical shortcoming, and it's something that you just yeah, ca- kind of learn to ignore, but, like when you're when you're getting yourself that deep into like the mechanics and the simulation of it all. Yeah, it just just kind of pulls you out of the the realism of it all. Mm-hmm. Those those sidearm grenades finally did something worth a damn. <laughs> although they're although they are the timed grenades this time. They they have four triple grenades. Well, well it's both. Like 
they like you saw them they fire like in a three uh three three arc spread but they also much like our recoilless rocket launcher the grenades have contact fuses so even hitting them directly is not required they just have to be close eh, good enough yeah and of course we got a we got a higher caliber version of the decider's chain gun it's 80 instead of 67 still kind of really only useful when it comes to like dealing with non-vt targets while the rest are generally good it's actually something i kind of need to rescind like the comments i made in like the very first video like a lot of the sidearms actually do have like plenty of uses against uh vts it's just that they always feel like way more like they feel less like the thing you're using to start and end the fight but to supplement your main fire and I, the other part is that there are certain like late game VTs and weapons that are equipped on like the sidearm that are uh, just as good as the main weapon. So that's kind of why I was thinking the rest were really not that good. I I, I was kind of in late game fuck everything mode <laughs> after I finished recording this campaign. Do the chain guns ever get good enough? You can use them as a primary. Uh no, like chain gun is anything classified as the chain gun is specifically meant for sidearm used to mop up like small artillery and infantry like the next step up from that are like the machine guns on your on your main weapon arm so definitely not gundam style um sidearms then. yeah taking out these ships because they are contributing to something that I completely forgot to mention that I was doing at the very start, but this is the first mission that actually, like, forces you to make use of the fact that your VTs are equipped with chaff. Those three ships patrol the, uh, the side of the arena and, like, shoot missiles at you that lock on you from very long range. And any time missiles are locked on, and the HUD will tell you when missiles are locked on, you press the chaff button and you will release chaff to just send them off course. Oh, cool. Yeah. You only get 10, though. And unfortunately, it is one of those things where it is required that every VT has it. Like, it's not a weapon that you have to, like, equip and queue up. Thank God for that. Yeah. But, of course, as a result of that, there's... Uh, with actually, like, I guess technically one exception, all VT generations only have a maximum of 10 chaff uses. I'm guessing that's a game balance thing more than anything. Pretty much. Plus it's like the exception I'm talking about lets you hold 20 chaff, but they're for specific units that you have to meet very uh, like certain requirements before you can even use them. So much so that like if you're playing through the campaign for the first time, you're never going to get to use them. Oh god, it's Super Robot Wars all over again. <laughs> Well, kind of. I mean, like, it's... I mean, those combat points are effectively your experience that you earn, and, like, they allow you to rank up, and, and when you rank up, that gives you access to certain, uh, to certain units. So already, we're coming up on the main platform where the battleship is, and, uh, like, for as much as, like, the friendly AI comes off as incredibly useless and dumb, their presence here is actually very welcome for what I'm going to be doing to, to finish off the main target. I mean, it's three on one um, without them, so anything that provides something else, something for the other guys to shoot at is going to definitely be appreciated. Oh, yeah, well, well, I'm not even talking about the VTs. Like, I could take them on no problem. It's the battleship that we gotta, uh, that we gotta worry about. The battleship that just pelted me with a bunch of rockets and brought my health to 50%. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta uh, use the wi windshield washers to <laughs> wipe all the grime and dirt. I still love just how this controller... I still love how this controller has buttons for shit that is, like... Like any other game, would just like assign it to something that is that changes its context based on what is happening. The fact that they just like had to make specific buttons for a fire extinguisher and windshield washing just shows how like dedicated they were to just designing this game to make use of every possible situation. 
I imagine when they were designing the controller, they were like, okay, so let's just put in every single button we can think of and then scale it back from there. Yeah, it's like, so. like come up with every sort of like feasible, realistic function you would have in a giant robot cockpit, make that for the controller first, then design the entire game around it. Someone's like, do we need turning signals? I don't think so, Bill. No. <laughs> what about jump jets? No. Well, well, we tested it. It kind of defeated the purpose. Those things. Would be really fucking helpful, but now's not the time. Yeah. So, while our buddies get repeatedly pelted Did and somehow don't die, we're Please calling for supplies. Over. before I realized that, oh wait, I was on the wrong frequency. Wagon Master, this is Oscar 3. <laughs> Do you copy? Over. This is Wagon Master. Oscar 3, what is it? This is Oscar 3, requesting supplies. Send Supply Chopper ASAP. This is Wagon Master. Roger that. The Supply Chopper is on its way. So yeah, there we go. And since we're in a safe spot, this means, like, not only will enemies not shoot at us, they won't shoot at the Supply Chopper because Fortunately, like, in a very smart decision, they always come from positions where, like, there's the least enemy resistance possible. So, the chopper is coming in straight from our right, so it won't get in the way of the battleship that is currently just bullying the hell out of my out of, out of my comrades. Please tell me this is like Metal Gear Solid 5 and it can just bonk you in the head with the crate. It doesn't, no. But it just magically... Damn it. But it magically siphons ammo, fuel, chaff, and 50% health into your VT. Ah, fairy dust. Yep. Oh yeah, you can also close the uh, the, the map monitor at uh, at the top if you so choose. But uh, but you kind of learn to work around the fact that it's taking up like the top center of your main screen anyway. So, this is why I wanted those deciders to be here. They are drawing aggro from a lot of these rockets, so I can peek out just enough that I'll zoom in with my 320SR and just take shots at the cannons. The thing with this, like, the conditions for being able to uh, fully destroy this is to take out the, the ship piece by piece. This includes taking out all the cannons and shooting at specific sections of like the ship's hull. Like the best way to tell is by looking for like those kind of like corner circles, uh, or not circles, the corner squares basically that normally would indicate like, that's actually kind of one thing I wish that this game did was let you uh, use the lock on to target the specific sections just so it would be easier to know if you hit them correctly. But no, this is a situation where you have to make use of the zoom and be and manually aiming your uh, your joystick to actually hit them. I'm genuinely surprised that the game's not realistic enough that you can just puncture the hull. Yeah, I don't know. Who 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 knows what sort of alloys and metals that they've got working with in 2080? Like they might be like compensating for the fact that you know they're in a world where. Warfare is now primarily fought with giant fucking robots. <laughs> I mean, we came in a gigantic ships that basically opened up the uh, the front just to allow us to walk out. Anything's possible. Yeah, true. And the Falchion is technically light enough that it could have been airdropped in. Like, think about that for a minute. I'm just thinking how long it would take for it to crawl its way out of the crater it just made. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Admittedly, the best real robot series are the ones that that just explain and infer enough about how everything works. And if there's anything that could poke holes in it, they just... They don't even go, uh, yeah, don't think about that, or they don't try and, and like, make up, like, some flimsy explanation. They just act like the question was never asked. <laughs> Because, I mean, if you air most um, giant robots, you airdrop them on a city, and technically speaking, that's considered a war crime. <laughs> that's considered an automatic victory. <laughs> <laughs> the enemy 
And speaking of victory, especially if it's we... especially if it's one of those shows where you launch from orbits, like no, that's an orbital kinetic weapon at that point. Yeah, that, that that's a few steps behind like a colony drop. Yeah. So there we go. Yeah, that was that was that mission. It's it's a pretty fun one, and uh, though from this point on. We're finally going to be getting a break from the first gen VTs. As as charming as it was getting to use like these slow old things, uh, we have to get to the part where the game starts going right. This thing, this controller that you're all amazed at and how ridiculous it is, we're not committed to just like resting on our laurels that uh, that this is some fun gimmick that you'll enjoy and then put away after a while. We're taking the gloves off. This game is getting real now. Don't tell me that's the new Type VT. Looks like it came right out from a garbage compactor. Ah, fuck, it's Nine Ball. Oh god, I never realized that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this is what we're piloting. <laughs> Get ready for the second generation of VT combat. You should have told me we were going straight into Armored Core 4. Not quite that. 